Hi everyone, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you today, albeit virtually. My name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the founder and CEO of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. I'm a futurist and a strategic advisor, basically to all G20 governments, but also to the vast majority of the world's most respected brands. Brands that you're actually using today, like Microsoft, Arm, Samsung, and so on and so forth. Now, as a futurist, I look at two futures ostensibly. So I look at the short and medium term futures, which are the kind of the next 20 years. But I also look at the deep future, the next 20 to 50 years. And the reason why I look that far out is because if you're a sovereign government, typically you care about the future of infrastructure, jobs, skills, energy, transportation, healthcare, the welfare state, capitalism as well, all kinds of different things. So during this presentation, it's my honor to be walking you through what I consider to be the future of the aluminium sector, as well as aluminium itself. So we're going to be taking a look over the next 10 years. We're going to be having a look at things that are already here today that will impact you now, as well as in the short, medium and long term futures. We're going to be having a look at new markets, new market opportunities and all manner of things. So with no further ado, I'm going to start here. So. When we think of innovation, yeah, particularly better within the aluminium sector, it's generally quite slow. One of the reasons for that basically, is the aluminium sector, basically, on the one hand, is an incredibly asset heavy industry. So it's actually very difficult to spin on a dime. Uh, however, innovation affects the aluminium industry both directly, and we'll discuss that, but also indirectly. And when I say indirectly, it's because increasingly we are using new technologies called creative machines to develop new things that either op open new market opportunities for you or limit some of the current market opportunities that you have. So when we talk about the future of innovation, we have artificial intelligences all, around, all the way around the world that are increasingly capable of iterating, designing, and actually in some cases, even manufacturing new products. Now, when we actually have a look at where these creative machines are, basically on the innovation scale, they're still very iterative. You know, we aren't in the, we aren't in the space at the moment where they can develop new primary innovations, let alone disruptive innovations. But nevertheless, they can do some interesting things. So typically, when we talk about a creative machine, a creative machine is, a, is an artificial intelligence that takes data from a variety of different sources. It understands what you as an organization are trying to achieve, the thing that you are trying to create, design, innovate, whatever it happens to be. And it then uses that context to come up with your next generation product whatever that happens to be. Now, once it's created that next generation product, which is generally done within a virtual simulation at extreme speed, these are machines that are able to innovate everything from computer ch chips to software, anywhere between a thousand to a billion times faster than today's current innovation methodologies and frameworks. But once these machines have actually created their new digital representation, they can, in some cases, as we see with robots, send it off to a 3D printer, the 3D printer prints it off. And if you use a 4D printer, these creative machines can design a new robot, send it to that printer, and that robot can then walk off the printer. So we already live in extraordinary times. But as an example basically, of where some of these creative machines are actually being used, they're being used in the material science sector, so for example, we already see these machines crunching thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions and even tens of millions of different compounds together to try to create new alloys. Now, in the case of both aluminium and steel, some of these machines are creating new alloys 200 times faster than traditional human scientists. And this particular one basically is actually from Japan. So the Japanese, basically, particularly companies like Toyota, are obviously very, very keen to develop new alloys. Now, in the aluminium sector, we're actually using artificial intelligence and these creative machines to create new 2,000, 3,000, and 7,000 construct alloys. However, they're also doing other things. So and I'm going to talk about this one in a little bit more depth in a moment. We have Airbus that are using these creative machines to design new aircraft components, but also new aircraft. Um, 
We have companies like Insilico that are using artificial intelligence to develop, in their case, 30,000 new game-changing drugs basically within the space of 21 days. That would have been previously impossible. So think about the speed that these machines actually operate. The speed at which they can create new alloys, new products, new materials, whatever it happens to be. And then think about the implications of how you react to that speed. So how you adapt, how flexible your organization is, but when it comes to both spotting new market opportunities, but also adapting your own business processes and operations to benefit from those. In addition to that, um, so we see Under Armour, I'm going to skip, but oh, there's a reason for that. So we also see companies like Under Armour using artificial intelligence to design new sneakers, sneakers that can be 3D printed. So in Under Armour's case, they created something called the Architect Sneaker. And the Architect Sneaker basically is a artificially intelligently, an artificially intelligently designed sneaker that was designed on day one that can be 3D printed day two. Now, in their case, Under Armour normally would take about 18 months to go from product concept to product on the shelf. This new technology does this within about two days. So the speed is phenomenal. Uh, NASA are also using these to create new lunar rovers. So, for example, when Autodesk originally went to NASA, NASA said, well, you know, why are you here? Um, Autodesk said, well, we think we have a way to create lunar rovers that are significantly lighter than anything that NASA has designed before. To which NASA answered, well, we've got a whole variety of different PhDs in our JPL building, and they can't really do anything better than find anything between 5 to 10% of weight savings, basically, for our lunar rovers. So we don't really think that you've got any shot at that. So Autodesk went off, came back a couple of weeks later, and said, we have something. And NASA said, well, have you managed to have you managed to reduce the weight of our lunar rovers by 10%? Because we kind of said that if you couldn't do that, basically, then we're not interested. To which Autodesk replied, no, we did 30%. Now, just think about the material savings when you can use these creative machines in new ways, basically, to cut significant amounts of material from a design, whatever that design actually happens to be. Now, in this particular case, when we start applying to these technologies to, for example, the aircraft industry, Boeing estimates that by 2040, the world's going to need, on average, around another 40,000 aircraft. That's going to be a mix of cargo aircraft. It's also going to be a mix of passenger aircraft. Um, and 50% of that demand is actually going to be in APAC. Um, however, when you have a look at what, Bo what Airbus particularly are doing with creative machines, 80% of an aircraft's airframe is aluminium by weight. So what happens when we start using a creative machine to design a new airframe? Now, this is the A330neo, but I see it's called Airbus's bionic design. And where Airbus go, others will follow. So on the one hand, these creative machines have the opportunity to significantly reduce the amount of aluminium required basically in the shells of aircraft. But to give you a real world example from Airbus, they also used creative machines to design new components. One of those components basically was a partition. Those ones basically that you typically have your feet up against basically when you're sitting in, uh, in, in either business class, uh, if you're lucky enough, basically, or economy, uh, if you're unlucky enough. Uh, but as you can see, the artificial intelligence designed new components that in this particular case were 90% lighter. So they actually used 90% less aluminium in this case. But significantly, this part, particular partition is 120% stronger and just as durable as the original partition. So we are significantly reducing the amount of material that we need to create functional products that design this, that do the same job as traditional products and that are in some cases even better than the traditional products. Now you start applying this type of technology to 40,000 new aircraft where you're reducing the airframe weight by say 10%, let alone anything more than that. And you can start seeing the impact that this time kind of technology might have on aluminium demand. Uh, however, you know, when we start looking forward, especially when we have a look at exponential energy, as I call it, 
Uh, we are now basically in this, er this era that I call the Cambrian era uh, of energy innovation. So, for example, we are moving from fossil fuels. Basically, when you actually have a look at your sector, basically, it's still very fossil fuel intensive. About 7% of all global greenhouse gas emissions actually come from heavy industry. Um, we're increasingly moving basically from bio from fossil fuels to biofuels, hydrogen, renewables. We'll discuss these in a little bit. Um, but in addition to that, when we actually have a look at the future of electric vehicles, which we'll also discuss, you know, 3D printed lithium ion batteries have 400 400% more energy density than a traditional lithium ion battery. We have ammonia coming through. I see we actually have boostable lithium ion batteries, which all of a sudden mean that we can create electric aircraft feasibly. Uh, in addition to that, we have new polymer batteries that can charge your electric vehicle within seconds to a full charge. We've got structural batteries, which actually turn the product itself into the battery. So for example, the chassis of the car becomes the battery, which means you don't need lithium ion batteries. And also potentially means you don't need hydrogen either. So when we talk about BEV and FCEV uh, and the battle there, we'll come to that soon. And then we also have wireless energy transmission. And again, when we actually have a look at the future of particular energy infrastructure, technologies, as well as transportation, again, why bother with hydrogen and why bother with lithium ion batteries, basically in your electric vehicles, when you can simply charge them wirelessly like you charge your phone. And over in the US, we're actually starting to see wireless charging infrastructure, particularly roads and pavements actually being rolled out and developed. So, and then from a man car manufacturer's perspective, companies like BMW, Toyota, Hyundai are actually also already developing cars that like your phone, like your smartphone, can be wirelessly charged while they're doing whatever it is they're doing. Now, when we actually have a look at the cost of renewables, bearing in mind that renewable energy generation costs increasingly decrease over time, and bearing in mind that fossil fuel prices, as you all know, basically all too well, basically fluctuate like crazy, um, on the one hand, moving to renewable energy sources gives you the opportunity to stabilize your energy prices. Secondly, it helps you decarbonize your industry. Um, and when we actually have a look at the future, for example, of solar electricity, solar panels today that you buy off the shelf are typically 20% energy efficient. Perskovite solar panels basically are 28 to 32% energy efficient. We have bacteria-based solar panels coming out of China that are 48% energy efficient, as well as new silicon solar panels coming out of the US Department of Energy that are already prototyped, basically, that are already coming out at 48% energy efficiency. Now, uh, if you put carbon and graphene over the, over the top of a solar panel, you can generate electricity from rain and snow. Uh, in addition to that, when we start having a look a little bit further out, and these are already prototyped in the labs, we have solar panels that are 50% energy efficient. If you put carbon nanotubes into a solar panel to recapture the heat, 80% energy efficient. And if you use 3D printing to create nanophotonic materials, you can create something called black silicon, which is a solar concentrator and solar panel, basically, which is 132% energy efficient. And a lot of these different new solar panels actually generate electricity from ambient light when it's cloudy and even from moonlight. Now, why I'm telling you this is because ultimately, when we have a look at the cost of using renewable energy technologies to generate electricity in this way, the cost of generating that electricity is increasingly going to zero. So what would happen to your particular business, organization, industry, the things that you care about, if all of a sudden I could write the, your cost of energy down to either zero or almost zero. It changes the economics of your industry for one, let alone when we talk about net zero and decarbonization. However, let's talk about net zero and decarbonization. So we've already seen the production of green steel in Sweden, which is now being used by Volvo in their dump trucks. It's also being used by Mercedes and a couple of other organizations. So when we have a look at green aluminium, Increasingly, we can use hydrogen, so particularly whether it's blue or particularly green hydrogen, basically to decarbonize, basically the heavy industry, uh, the heavy industry sector. In addition to that, though, we have companies like Heliogen, basically that have created solar ovens, basically which has received a nine-figure backing, basically from Bill Gates. 
which allows us to completely decarbonize aluminium smelting, steel, and concrete production. Um, so these use solar concentrators, but again, there is a pathway right now to green aluminium. And green aluminium, or sustainable aluminium, is going to be increasingly important for a reason that I'll come to in a moment. Particularly from a country versus country, organization versus organization, and from a market perspective. Now, when we have actually have a look at some of the emerging opportunities based in the aluminium sector, firstly, we have 3D printing powders. Now, on the one hand, we are using these powders already to 3D print F-35 jet engines. So when we actually have a look at 3D printing, it's moved from consumer printing to sort of SMB, SME kind of type printing, all the way through to aerospace printing. Now, aerospace 3D printing requires some metal powders basically with very, very specific properties. If you think about Lockheed Martin, if you think about Boeing and these other organizations, and also Grumman, um, they don't just need any kind of powder, they need some very specific powders. So 3D printing aluminium powders basically will be in increasing demand basically over the next 5, 10, 20 years. And the reason for this again is because creative machines like I described earlier are a perfect fit for the precision that we see in 3D printing. So increasingly, everything will be 3D printed. We even have 3D printed cars, 3D printed buses. Boeing want to 3D print an entire aircraft, um, which would require big printing. We're seeing 3D printed boats, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we have a look at the concrete sector, uh, so on the one hand, we have the production of green concrete, basically, which actually uses potash from different sources. Uh, but courtesy of the Direct2 project, we've actually seen the development of new sort of alkaline concretes that can be merged and integrated with aluminium or the other way around to create aluminium reinforced concrete. Um, and that's an increasing sector basically in, the, uh, in Europe. Now, from a renewables perspective, we obviously have hydrogen, we've got solar and wind. We now have over 1 trillion watts of renewable energy generation installed around the world. That needs to get to about 6 trillion watts. When we actually have a look at things like the European Big Green Deal, as well as the US and the China, as well as India's drive basically to embrace, should we say, net zero by 2050, energy forms a huge part of them being able to meet those commitments that they're making, they've just made at COP26. So inevitably, when we actually have a look at the amount of investment that's now going into renewables, basically that's actually getting supercharged. And when we actually have a look at ESG-related investments, ESG-related investments now account for $34 trillion worth of assets under management. And that is expected to grow up to about 50% over the next sort of five to 10 years with some organizations like City putting together multi-trillion dollar funds to invest in ESG-related activities, companies, processes, and things. Robots, when we actually have a look at robots, basically increasingly robots are more intelligent, more sophisticated, they're able to do more things. Basically using machine vision, all of a sudden, basically we can create dark warehouses, dark restaurants, we can do all kinds of different things. So when you give robots, new actuators, when you give them vision that is in some cases superior to human vision, and when they are able to teach each other new things using hive mind constructs, which we call generalized robots, as we see with Google, as we, as we see with Hon Hai, where you teach one robot one thing and it teaches the rest everything, um, we see more robots being rolled out. So by 2026, we estimate that that'll be a $74 billion market growing from a base of about 31 billion today. Space, companies like Relativity Space are actually using different alloys to 3D print entire, in this case, rockets. So there's a huge move, as you can see, basically just in these particular markets to doing new things in new ways, using new materials, new alloys, new opportunities. Uh, now, when we actually have a look at the construction,
the way that we build buildings is changing. Now, on the one hand, when you have a look at the modular building market, basically that's growing at about 5% per year, and that's expected to hit about $50 billion basically in the next few years. However, when you actually have a look at 3D printed buildings like the one that I just showed you, particularly as it relates to aluminium, so things like sills basically, and other aluminium components that go into buildings, these buildings are built using lava crete and all kinds of new materials. Some of these materials are actually carbon negative. Now, when we have a look at 3D printing buildings, you potentially have an opportunity with 3D printed aluminium powders. Um, so this is where I would actually encourage you to explore the future of construction and see basically what new market opportunities come out of that. Uh, now, moving on to transportation, and we're on the sort of final stretch now. All cars are going autonomous. So we're in this kind of awkward transition moment today, basically where we have cars that don't drive themselves, cars that kind of drive themselves, so sort of semi-autonomous, and cars that do drive themselves, so category four, category five driverless vehicles. Now, it's expected that once we've made the full transition to fully autonomous vehicles, which is really estimated by about 2035 to 2040, because in order to replace the entire global vehicle fleet, we need to significantly ramp construction, we need to significantly ramp manufacturing, because we can only manufacture a certain number of cars each year, that we will have 30% fewer cars on the roads. So that affects the that affects the aluminium market, basically really more over the medium to long term, but I just wanted to sort of put that out there. Um, when we actually have a look at the future of transportation, it's all going electric. Now, on the one hand, we're moving from internal combustion engines, basically which are obviously sort of generally cast, to uh, battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. But in the interim, really battery electric vehicles look like they're actually winning. Um, and they're taking much greater share than fuel cell electric vehicles. For example, when you have a look at Volkswagen, Volkswagen have just placed orders for $48 billion worth of lithium um, for their own EVs. Um, same with Tesla. So while the way that we build electric batteries basically is actually changing, we're seeing some of the, the resource scarce materials basically like lithium trying to be eked out um, certainly basically as we look over the longer term um, fuel cell electric vehicles basically are increasingly coming through particularly when we actually have a look at trucks when we have a look at cargo ships for example uh, and other things but generally at the minute yeah bevs win um, however we also see a move basically from casting in ice vehicles basically to the use of sheets in electric vehicles, because when you actually have a look at electric vehicles, about 30% of the weight of some of these new electric vehicles um, is aluminium. Um, so we also have the move to sustainable aluminium. Now, this is actually increasingly important, particularly as organizations look at trying to reduce the footprint of their own organizations and their supply chains. One of the other things I sort of want to put on the table, basically, is when we actually have a look at the way that future cars are actually made, we are already, courtesy of companies like Big Rep, seeing them 3D print cars. We're seeing Oli 3D print buses, and we also see the ability. We also see the ability to 3D print carbon fiber coming through as well. So 3D printed cars and vehicles will be much more of a thing over the medium to long term. So putting that onto the table. Um, we also see new manufacturing uh, uh, technologies coming through. So, so for example, if you have a look at Tesla, Tesla are now starting to develop a 12,000 ton gigapress. Now, the 12,000 ton gigapress, basically, which is designed to usurp their 6,000 and 8,000 ton gigapresses, will use cast aluminium uh, and ingots, obviously, to create a car. Generally, it's thought to be the Model Y using one single sheet, one single piece. Now, on the one hand, this means that Tesla will be able to hit an estimated 20 million vehicles per year. But on the other hand, it also reduces their cost basically of manufacturing. And when we actually have a look at the 12,000 ton gigapress, for example, it's generally estimated it's going to be using about 120 kilograms basically of aluminium compared to the 8,000 ton gigapress, which is about 104 kilograms. Um, so 
there's opportunities there for those markets. Now, again, putting this one on the table, organizations like BMW basically are very, very keen to embrace the circular economy. Now, when we have a look at the circular economy, this is the iVision Circular. Everything about this vehicle can be recycled, everything, even down to the laser etched badge. The adhesives that we use to put these cars together are very different. The materials that we use to put these cars together are very different. And so this is an, another area that I would encourage you to explore further. Uh, however, we also see the death of the car. Because if you have a self-driving car that allows you to take away the dashboard, the pedals, and the steering wheel, what you're actually left with is a pod. So consider this, when we actually have a look at the future of the aluminium sector as it relates to car production, we are already seeing the death of the car. And this isn't lost basically on companies like BMW, Volkswagen, Audi, and so on and so forth, Toyota, Mercedes basically are developing modular concepts. And as you can see, when we start looking at these modular concepts, all of a sudden you have Aprili who create a fully autonomous self-driving hotel suite. So for example, if you even looked at any of these markets, you know, if you're focused on the car industry or the vehicle industry, have you looked at some of the alternative modes of transportation that fully autonomous driving actually enables? Then we have a look at ships and trucks. You know, when you actually have a look at Volvo's self-driving trucks and vehicles, you'll notice there's no cab. So again, basically when we talk about aluminium volumes, this truck, if it uses aluminium, and it's probably gonna be sheet aluminium, will actually use far less aluminium than a traditional truck. Um, we then, having a look at other sort of uh, new modes of transportation, we have flying taxis, still a very low base, but you know, the regulators are approving them. We're seeing more companies developing and designing them. Do you actually have a point of view basically on this particular market? Bearing in mind that that particular market, those drones will in eventually end up hitting and butting against the traditional aviation market. Um, and then we have Mac 1 and Mac 3 trains in a vacuum tube, Hyperloops. This is the Zolaris Hyperloop, which is generated, created out of Spain. But these are completely new types of transportation. In which case, this allows us to move people and cargo, both at a regional, national, and intercontinental level eventually, at max speeds. So do you have a point of view or a foot in this market? And then, of course, there's this market in 2024 onwards. Space and rocket travel. So that's courtesy of SpaceX. They've already done pre-flight tests. This is kind of the Dragon, the Crew Dragon, for example, but in the Falcon Heavy. They estimate that that's going to start rolling out at about 2024, 2024. However, basically, have you actually looked at the space sector as a future opportunity, bearing in mind that the cost of accessing space has fallen by 99% over the past 20 years? 
And that's it from me. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. What I really wanted to try to do is get across to you basically that we are making new products in new ways, making old products in new ways, and that actually affects your industry. But in addition to that, there are lots of new market opportunities basically for which aluminium is ideally suited. So thank you very much for listening. And I know basically that we're going to be going over to the panel shortly. So it's goodbye from me until I see you later. Take care. Goodbye.